She comes running gleefully at her village and through the fields as if this was a sound of music bootleg. She runs and skips all the way into the far field until she tumbles down into the tall grass. She suddenly gets a vision and begins hearing voices again. Then she suddenly finds this shiny silver sword. She raises the sword up high like He-Man. Then she gets suddenly transported to this dark forest. Cheers love, the cavalry's here. And so is this big black wolf. Actually. <sighs> a pack of them and they look like they're fleeing something. It looks like the cavalry's hunting them. So Joan runs after them only to find a burning village. Looks like the cavalry is committing war crimes. <laughs> While the wolves scavenge what they could get, Joan tries to find her family. Then her sister Catherine finds her instead. She hides Joan in a closet. Then one of the English soldiers busts into their home. Her sister gets cornered by another Englishman. Then a few more come in. They pillage the place. Then this one tries to desecrate Catherine. She tries to fight back, but she gets game-ended with Joan's sword. Then this trash can thinks that wasn't enough, so he does the most despicable thing to Catherine's corpse. Your turn now. The siege is over, and Joan watches her sister going into a shallow grave. Of course, Joan is utterly traumatized by this whole ordeal. Then her father says she's going to live with her aunt and uncle for a while until they rebuild. Joan is then transported back to their home, and she's still absolutely petrified. Her aunt and uncle don't really think too much about it. She'll grow up, find a good man making some children. Then the next day, Joan requests to see a priest. She then goes into a confession hall with the priest. Then she expresses her absolute anger about the Englishman thanks to her witnessing everything. The priest tries to calm her down, but she's overstocked with guilt and agony. So the priest resorts to classic, the Lord always has a good reason, saying, that event really makes it hard for Joan to accept what happened. Then they all go home. Her uncle says he'll never let her out of his sight, but Joan is immediately out of his sight. She rushes to the rain in order to go back to the church and forcibly drink the whole Holy wine this early. Let's head over to Chinon. A message for the Dauphin of France. Where this kid is training with swords. Then a message runs all the way through the castle. The Dauphin of France, Charles VII, is coming in for the message. So the guards training little Louis here get back to their post. The Dauphin sees little Louis sword fighting instead of studying, and he insists more on the slashing. The message is apparently from Joan and she claims to be sent by God, but the Dauphin's advisors think it's just another loony. She wants you to give her an army at your expense. Joan also wants an army to fight the English with, but the advisors are strongly against this. Charles' mother-in-law gives him the green light to see Joan though, because she thinks Charles could easily expose her if she was a fake. Tremolet, one of the advisors, still wants to sway Charles, but the mother-in-law argues that Joan is already making waves with the claims that she's from God. She also argues that Joan might be a good morale booster for their armies. If she could put back the fire in our army. The next day, a small celebration is held. Then Charles gets word that Joan is coming. Tremolet still doesn't want this, but Charles pays no attention. Instead, Charles gets a brilliant idea from one of his lackeys, a body double. If she's really sent by God, she'll know who the real Charles is. But if she's an assassin, she'll end the wrong person. Charles announces a little game for his audience that someone will pretend to be the king. So Alençon, Giles de Reis, La Hire. Volunteer. He scans them, but deems them unworthy to be duplicates. But maybe Jean Duolan here could do it. They dress Duolan here in a kingly disguise. Then Charles asks for Jean to be brought up. It seems that this is all a time skip because Joan has matured into a young woman. She's welcomed by Tremolet to see the Dauphin of France. Tremolet introduces his highness, but immediately Joan knows what's up. She needs to see the real Dauphin because time is of the essence. No, you'll see who pass for a king. But Tremolet tells her to find him herself. Joan slowly looks at the face of each person in that throne room until she slowly walks up to the real dolphin hiding behind Alison, Giles, and Lahire. She wants to approach him, but the men pull out their daggers and threaten her to stay back. Joan knows that Charles isn't the king yet, so this convinces Charles to let his men pull back their knives. She rushes to him, which scares everyone. Then she hugs him and whispers a message for him and only him. Charles asks Joan to follow him to a private room where Tremolet will stand guard outside. Then I knew that God had chosen me. In the room, Joan began to recall the past events of the first time she heard the voices. Then the next occurrence of these voices was many years later, and she saw the shape of a man in the clouds. She began getting clear visions of this man. Then she got to the conclusion that God had chosen her. This also baffled her because she was just a poor girl, so she decided to wait and not tell anyone. Afterwards, she felt the same strange wind follow her every day, even when going to Mass. One day, she witnesses a divine intervention in her own church. God had given me a message. 
and she was given a message. The message was clear, liberate France and make Charles VII the king of France. Charles then steps out and introduces Joan to Duelan. He then asks him to find Joan a suitable room for her to stay in the castle and that she should always be protected. Joan is shown to her room. Then she requests some water, a priest, a warhorse, a sword, armor, a banner, and for Duelan to write to the king of England. She's already living the high life at the first second. Jean wants to send a message for the English to either leave in peace or leave in pieces. It would be the height of folly to let this the royal family begins gathering their allies to war, but the advisors are still against Joan leading the army. So there's only one thing left to do to know her true intentions. Check her virginity. Wait, what? Yep, you heard that right. Charles has this shindig set up to see if Joan's a virgin or not, and everyone is gathered in this room. Advisors, the royal family, soldiers, priests, nuns, and of course, doctors. <clears throat> this old nun is about to begin her work, so the holy hymns start. She begins to check Joan's hoo-ha, and she's in the clear. Anything by which we can verify your claim. Next scene, Joan begins to talk to some higher ups at the church in France, and it's not looking too good for her. No prior military experience, no knowledge about weapons of war, and no combat training. They need a convincing sign to prove that she's God sent, but she's not Jesus to perform miracles. Joan begins to gaslight them that God is really with her, and she can only prove this if she was allowed to bring an army to Orleans. Suddenly, this next scene shows a Tribeca sieging this building. This guy, Lord Du noise seems to be in charge of things around here. He gets up from the wreckage and the trebuchet shot. Then Zane Trailies here brings the good news that food, supplies, and an army with the blue ribbon in her hair to tie up Talbot. Led by Joan are on the way. Some knights in this field doubt the news since a woman will be fighting amongst them. But here comes Joan of Arc, the rider. She's here to rendezvous with these men from Lord Dunois. But Lord Dunois is this guy. Joan wants to be shown to the other side of the river to meet the captain of the English army. Joan gets too riled up about this, so Lord Dunois calms her down and they ride back slowly to the city. Joan's army follows behind her and the people are all beholding before Joan. Jill, let me show you something. Joan's soldiers follow her to this tavern. Then she gets hysterical because she feels like they're all wasting time. The men are shocked by this display, so they tell her to calm down and instead join the planning of the siege. Joan doesn't understand all this command and conquer babble, so she says she's only here to deliver a message, give mercy to the English or give them body bags. Specifically, they're going to attack at the most fortified spot, the Torrelis. Have to understand, it's not easy for us. Joan claims that God will be their greatest weapon. And come on, everyone thinks she sounds crazy right about now. She just wants them to follow blindly, but that just sounds cuckoo. They also doubt her since she's a woman. So La Hire gets slapped. Joan then cuts her hair angrily, but Duelan just thinks that's a fashion disaster. She then writes a letter to the Englishmen, which is laughably pathetic. The knights think the message is pathetic, then the Englishmen think it's pathetic. Word gets to Joan, but in a more censored version, so I guess this means war. Joan then begins getting visions of the war, and she knows that the battle has started without her, so... <laughs> She saddles up and rides quickly with her banner. Looks like Dunois thought he could one-up the English with an ambush, but it got all turned around. Joan then rides towards the English with the soldiers behind her. The English's drawbridge closes, and with it, their window of attack. Not for long, however, because Joan jumps the jagged English wall, then rides to cut the drawbridge open. <laughs> The French come charging in and the real battle begins. Joan rides around like a mad woman and Doom follows the Englishmen as the French take their outpost. It's a total victory, but Joan remarks that they have to gather all their forces because she knows the English are rebuilding the bridge to get ahead of the French in terms of attacking. A massive army is gathered. Then, Dunois shows Joan the Torrelys. It's a large fortified wall and the English are watching closely. Dunois and his men begin planning their next move. Then, the captain of the English army is informed about their visitors. Joan rides to the front. We would pull them down before nightfall. And she makes a speech. Either they live or their souls leave their bodies. Of course, Joan is made fun of once again, so it's almost time for the next battle. The English begin to man the walls, and Joan gives a rallying speech. And she promises that by nightfall, the English will fall. The siege starts with Joan's war cry, and the soldiers follow with battle in their eyes. They begin to swarm the walls, but the English are beginning to grow disoriented from the sudden attack. They keep toppling the French's ladders, but they continue to fight and climb on. Joan is doing nothing but screaming like a lobotomite. Hey, come on, come on! 
Then she follows into battle. Joan scales the wall, but an arrow is shot on her chest and she falls. She's taken back to base and Lahire begins to pray for her. Amazing plot armor because she revives. But if that arrow stays in her longer, she just might pass. So she does the logical thing and pulls it out herself. She still wants to battle, but she's heavily injured. She makes Duolan promise that they'll be back to the battle. Then she passes out. Quickly do something! Don't worry, the doctor that just arrived says she's just sleeping. Duolan then spills the news of Joan's survival to Lord Dunois. Then he wants everyone to retreat because of Joan's schizo orders. The army is in shambles. They sound the retreat against Joan's orders, and the army takes a rest for the night. The boys gather around the campfire. Then Lahire brings the news that Joan is slowly being seen as a divine figure. Heck, even as a saint. Then the boys question if she's really been sent by God. What are you making? A message for the English. Ironically, Joan then dreams of the man on the throne again. She then ventures into this dark wooden hall. Then she remembers that wretched day they took Catherine. Thankfully, she immediately wakes up and the entire French army is in slumber. Then one of the English idiots loudly mock the French army. Joan then raises her banner and there goes her loony, noble phantasm again. The English couldn't believe she's alive, but that's the power of gotcha rolls. Joan then wakes up the rest of the army. The soldiers wake up, then they erect a breaching tower, and according to Joan's specific orders, they should bring it to the English backwards. The English then wake up Lord Glassdale and he gets word that Joan is back from the grave. Both sides are getting riled up for battle. Because they always agree to attack. Then Joan's plan was to use the breaching tower as a bridge. Their defenses are broken. Let the slaughter begin. The French enter the fort with unrivaled vigor and begin the destruction. The English then begin to load this weapon called the porcupine. Then Joan senses its presence, so she orders the archers to burn that large door. Both sides get casualties. Then they both reload their weapons. This time, however, the French began preparing the battering ram. Joan is almost shot, but the soldiers begin to show their loyalty to her, with one of them taking the arrow for her. The English are losing ground. Then the French breach the gates with fiery fury. Joan then gets another vision of the man on the throne, but it seems like he's displeased with her. Duolan snaps her back to reality, and Lahire welcomes her into glorious victory. <laughs> Victory! The celebration is short-lived because Joan sees the wake of doom her army left behind. Joan is in total disarray about the war, so it's confession time. Well, that's cut short because the English are preparing to retaliate. Many hours later, the English and the French armies meet up in the fields. Then Joan volunteers to go alone and talk to the blimey blokes. Hear ye, hear ye. Joan brings another message from God. Go home. Go now! In peace! or go commit hoster bath. Miraculously, the English peacefully retreated. Charles back home gets word of the story and Orleans is free. The English get the message, so they want her fried and served with 11 secret spices. The brave knights of France go back home and their victory is massively celebrated. Charles is getting frisky about the preparation for the coronation. Then his bishops convince him that they have to do this now and in the holy church. Joan walks in the cathedral, then sometime later, it's coronation time. Charles VII then walks at the center of the aisle, silently viewed by his soldiers and citizens. He makes it to the holy order of men, to which they give him the blessing. The crown is placed on his head and another big celebration arises. Joan is in total celebration mode. Then she flashes back to war. She even took an arrow to the knee. But that's a joke for a different game. Welcome to the walls of Paris where the French are trying their hardest to breach it. It turns out Joan was expecting Lord Dunois and 10,000 reinforcements. But now that Charles is king, he seems to have forgotten his end of the deal. Duolan is fed up with Joan's antics and they gotta face facts that war is beginning to look over. La Hire professes his faith to Joan, but it's the king's decision now whether to continue or not. Charles' mother-in-law talks to the advisors and she says they could not afford to get 10,000 men. Their whole agenda is on a different future for France now. Joan then angrily rushes to King Charles. Why did you take the army you gave me? To which he explains that they're largely considering diplomacy. But Joan thinks this is not the case considering they're dealing with the English here. She then angrily hands out the letters from the poor French people begging for support. Then she storms off. Of course, she storms off to the local church where Duolan visits her. She says the voices in her head have stopped telling her signs and isn't that a good thing? Well, she thinks that her mission is not over. Joan still wants that army. I believe in you more than anyone. 
So the Grand Order deliberates how they could deal with Joan. Here's how the advisors bridge this out. They're going to plan for her capture. There it is. The coronation really did come with bad comedy. Time passed and Joan is on another battlefield, but this time with a much smaller army. For the safety of the city, Joan is locked out and the French are taking massive losses. Joan fights with all she's got, but she gets captured. Suddenly, a divine vision upholds her. She calls out to God in the sky, but it looks like nature overgrows her. That's when the English knocked her out. Joan then wakes up to this shady looking old man as he narrates the end of her life to her. I must admit you have a big imagination. And it looks like the man on the throne has been ended with an arrow. The old man tells her that life ending is just plain romantic. Looks like a different personality entered her head this time because the old man suddenly changes from that to a young boy. Then she changes face to the man from the throne. Apparently, this face of darkness is Satan, as Joan senses it, and he talks about the balance of good and evil. She then gets a slap back to reality. Then here comes the Duke of Burgundy. She's confident that King Charles will pay the ransom, but the Duke doubts that. Heck, the Duke doubts everything because he's utterly faithless. The Duke then accuses her of witchcraft. And God who allowed you to be caught? Then she's locked back. Duolan then gathers enough funds to pay for Joan's ransom, and it's a lot of gold pieces. This doesn't look good with the greed on their faces. However, soon, here comes Bishop Pierre Cauchon, and they're taking Joan away to a trial, accusing her of heresy. It also turns out that the English paid her ransom, not the French. Joan's eventually transferred to a holy order where she'll be judged by these holy Englishmen. You may ask me things that I won't want to answer. She resists to take the other because some secrets are only between her and King Charles. But the trial goes on. She's then accused of sorcery and is taken back to jail. Joan goes into schizo mode and gets tempted by Satan once more. The bishop and his holy men hold another private trial for Joan, but she's being quite unreasonable. This trial goes on for days and over time, despite rummaging through a lot of evidence. What about all those dresses you were given? The holy men are becoming quite scared of Joan. The trial continues and the accusation of Joan is not ending. Anyone sends her quite into a mental fiasco. Eventually, she results in asking Satan to be set free. Set me free. Well, here it is. The climax and Joan is in the town square, surrounded by the Holy Order, the fated Grand Order, and all of the soldiers. The holy men give their take, but all Joan could do was beg God for her life. She's deemed a heretic, and they give her two last chances. Then Joan signs this document that gives God away. She wants it back, and of course, she's taken away. The church does what they do best and wash their hands from the situation. The English then set her up in men's clothing so that she could be accused of witchcraft. Boy, these were really the dark times, huh? The bishop denies her of a confession, so instead she confesses to Satan. It was all the things that people believe. O Fortuna begins to play, and Joan is burned at the stake. 500 years later, she's deemed as a saint, and she now resides in a wafu gambling game. Let's all prepare to confess, because that's it for The Messenger, the story of Joan of Arc. What did you think about this childhood holy conquest movie? Let us know at the comments below using hashtag cinema recap. This was The Messenger, the story of Joan of Arc by Gamont. Starring John Malkovich, Dustin Hoffman, and Mila Jovovich. Until the next Divine Gotcha Pull, farewell.